Hey, how's it going everyone? Kermode here. Welcome to another tutorial. In this video, I'm gonna be giving you guys my beginner beats course. This is gonna be a super quick crash course on everything you're gonna to need to get started writing beats or even just getting started in Ableton. So if you're a first day user, first week user, first month, maybe even your first year, this video is gonna be for you. We've got a lot to cover, so let's just get going. In this video, we're gonna be covering a lot. I'm gonna be telling you guys different types of drums, different types of beats, how to actually program drums, both in audio and MIDI, layering, processing, groove, like everything. There's gonna be stuff in here for Ableton users, obviously, and there's gonna be even stuff for producers that are just wanting to get to know what drums are, what different styles of beats are, etc. So before we get started, I do wanna mention, if you guys don't have any drum samples, or you have very few, or you just want some new ones, I recommend heading down to the description of this video and grabbing my beginner Ableton starter pack. It's just gonna be a bunch of samples to get to get you started. You're gonna want some to follow along with this video. And I just recommend grabbing them anyways. There's some sweet high quality samples. I put a lot of effort into it. But let's get started with part number one. So part one, I'm gonna be describing to you guys right now the different types of drums that you're gonna need or the fundamental types of drums you're gonna to need to understand beat writing. So the very first type is a kick drum, and a kick drum is a low, bassy type drum that is gonna be the foundation of any type of beat. All the other types of drums I'm gonna be talking about, you can technically go without, but unless you're writing like ambience or drone, you can't get away without using a kick drum. Kick drums are the low, bassy drums you see on a kick on a kit, often known as a bass drum, and they can sound anything from like this one here, to all these different styles. They all share the same purpose, and that's gonna be to be the main foundation of your beat. So if I do a basic house beat here, it's gonna be the drum that plays that role. That's the kick drum. Now the next type of drum you need to know about is called a snare drum. And a snare drum is very often in beats. Sometimes it's replaced with a clap. So if you hear clap or see clap, they're often similar. And a snare drum is a higher pitched, noisier, more impactful drum that is used to kind of play the uh, interplay with the kick drum, but also still hold down a very fundamental time. So we have all these different styles. You hear some are like claps, some are cloppy, some are really loose, some are really punchy. But all these drums, they play the fundamental role of kind of being opposite to the kick drum in timing. Typically snares are actually a lot straighter and more simpler than a kick pattern, which will be a lot kind of groovier and fill in the holes in between snares, even if the kick drum is typically the foundation, the first hit. Sometimes they will even play at the same time for things like house beats, but I'll be showing you guys that in a later part. Next, I want to talk about 808s. And 808s are often going to be your bass line in a beat. And you hear them in hip hop, trap, future bass, now 808s get their name from the old 808 machine because it had a very specific bass drum that was really low and subby in it. But nowadays the term just, in my opinion, refers to long, impactful subtones that are kind of like really long kick drums. So this one here, for example, is gonna be perfect for our 808 in this part. And as mentioned, personally, I like to have both though. Now the next type of drum is more of a grouping of drums and those are cymbals and those are all the white noisy, splashy filler types of sounds that take on multiple roles. Closed hats usually play the short rhythmic part of a beat, such as this. Now, 
Then you also have what's known as open hats, where they are essentially just long closed hats because open hats and closed hats come from the same symbol on a drum kit and they are much longer. So you'd get something like this in your beat and they would take on a roll like this. Next, you have a crash, and a crash symbol is a big, splash, impactful symbol that's often going to be at the beginning of your beat, and it sounds a little something like this. So that one's going to be really important for adding energy, and symbols in general are just used for filling out your beat and filling out the frequencies and the groove and just adding on to the fundamental 808 kick drum and snare drum. Now next I want to talk about tom drums. These toms are often quite low, similar to a kick drum but a bit higher pitched, and instead of being fundamental to the beat, they're often used for what's known as a tom fill. So what I like to do is often place these at the end of a beat just for an added, uh, added accent. Now the last type of drum I'm gonna tell you about is very broad, so it's kind of hard to explain this one. So percussion could be anything from glass to pots and pans to clapping to snapping to hand drums to taiko drums. And you'll really hear it. I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of percussion in my lifetime. And you get everything from what sounds like an anvil to a weird flicking rubber band sound to whatever these are. And what I'll do is these are used to fill out your beat with more interesting tones and timbres than just a cymbal. So maybe something like this. And I'll just keep that going, create a nice little pattern with that. So just like that, we have our beat going. Now there are tons of different types of drums. There's more technical terms for everything, but that's everything you need to know to start you know, looking for different types of drums in your library and understanding their role when writing a beat. So let's move on to our next part. So part two is gonna be all about writing drums in audio in Ableton. And it really is as straightforward as you think. You want to have, first of all, different tracks for each different type of drum. So I personally like to start off with a kick drum and a snare drum. And usually I like to start with a four bar loop or an eight bar loop for the fundamental of my beat. Now, if you don't know much about rhythm theory, I actually recommend after this video or pausing here, going and learning a bit more about rhythm, bar structures, how many beats make up a bar, things like that. This video would get way too long if we went into that. So I'm gonna assume you know a bit of basics when it comes to beat writing. And if you don't, really all you need to know is everything gets broken down into fours. You know, you break things down into four beats per bar, uh, usually four to eight bars per loop, something like that. So usually I start with a four bar and I add variation. And what I like about writing drums in audio is you get this nice visual. So let's start with a kick drum. And let's drop it on the timeline. And when I say you get a nice visual, you get to see how long the waveform is. You can uh, hover your mouse over the edge and take away any dead air. You can see these little squares here. You can add fades if your kick drum's too long. Or again, if you want, you can just shorten it. You get a nice visual representation of it. So I like that nice short kick drum there. And from there you grab a kick or a snare to put uh, as another fundamental drum. Kind of like that one there, so we're gonna drag it on. 
and usually you have it I, if you're going for a quicker beat you would have it every quarter note like this or if you want something a little slower you put it in the middle you put it every uh, third every second beat and if you have a metronome it's a lot easier to figure out usually what I'll do is I'll place the snares across for a four bar pattern so there we go and then I'm going to start laying down some kick drums here we go this is going to be our four bar loop right here And what's nice too is because we're working in audio, we can do nice things like reverse snares if we want to. So you could place a drum and you could press R to reverse it really easily. Maybe turn down the volume per clip, which is kind of nice. Things that are a little harder to do with MIDI. Cool. I'm gonna get some symbols going. So we're gonna load in a crash. We're gonna load in some hats. And I'm just gonna put both closed and open hats on the same track. Bring down the volumes to match. And let's pick our symbol. And it's as simple as just dropping it on there. Same thing as well when you're working with something like a crash, you can easily press the reverse button here or R to reverse it. See how that gives a nice lead in with energy. And then from there, let's add some nice symbols in. So let's get some cl closed hats. And what's cool about audio, and I'm gonna keep making comparisons between writing in audio and MIDI, since they both have their own advantages and disadvantages, is you can put several different closed hats on the same track, which kind of gives it a, a nice vibe where you know, no hat is exactly the same because it's very easy for beats to get kind of stale and repetitive. That's cool, that's cool. And what we can do as well is if we want, we could duplicate this track and we could add some nice quieter offset ones. So maybe something like this to add a bit of swing every once in a while. And maybe fill in some of those holes. So really it's that simple. Writing beats in audio is as simple as making a different track for each type of sound. And the reason I personally like writing beats in audio is you get adv the advantage of all the audio editing properties within Ableton. I haven't even touched upon warping or anything like that. Now there's also one last advantage to working with audio that I want to tell you guys about. And that's actually using loops. And loops are something we haven't talked about yet. And loops are usually pre-made uh, percussion or hat loops or I mean anything really a loop can be anything but in this case I'm referring to percussion loops where you can get these packs that have pre-made rhythms and grooves in them things like that and you can easily drop it in and because this was the same tempo it's very easy to integrate and what's nice about Ableton without going into too much detail about how to edit audio you can start to chop and edit this loop 
to make it a little more unique and a little more your own, which is kind of nice. I like going in there and further editing things, adding cool little glitches and fills and editing audio is going to be a whole other tutorial unto itself. But that's the advantage of working with audio is you get all these different audio editing properties, especially when it comes to loops that you don't typically get when you're working with MIDI. And then maybe we'll do something kind of interesting here where we're going to use one of the warping properties in Ableton. Let's move on to our next part, which is how to write beats in MIDI. Okay, so now I want to tell you guys about how you can write drums in MIDI, specifically using an instrument in Ableton known as Drum Rack. So let me grab Drum Rack here. And Drum Rack, what it is in really its most basic raw definition, is a drum kit where you can customize the sound of each drum on the kit and it can have up to 128 different sounds. So what you can see is that within each of these cells it has a different note on the keyboard assigned to each one. So if I were to put a sound in here such as a kick drum, this one here, this would be assigned to C1. So I can either play it right here or if I turn on my keyboard, I can play that sound on my keyboard with C1. So what you want to do is you want to create a kit of sounds that you like. What's really cool as well is you can then change the sound in here from its volume to transposition, even how much it takes to fade in and fade out. Now, a full detailed explanation of this device here, known as Simpler, which exists within each cell of a drum rack, is for a whole other video. For now, what I just want you to understand is that you're dropping drums into the different cells. So in this one, we have our kick. I'm then going to grab a snare drum. I'm then going to grab maybe a piece of percussion. I'm going to grab a hi-hat. There we go. So we have our kit made. You can spend as much time on as you want putting sounds in here, but this is the kit I'm going to use for this basic explanation. Now what differs is we can't write our sounds in audio. We have to use what's known as MIDI. So what you need to do is you want to highlight how long you want your beat to be. You want to right click and you want to insert a MIDI clip. Now when you do that, you'll see this clip appeared above and down below if we enlarge it here, you'll see we have our drums labeled here and a timeline as long as this clip down here. This here is the piano roll and this is our MIDI editor. In the MIDI editor, we can now double click to insert sounds. So what I'm going to do is start double clicking to insert the sounds where I want them. Let's press play on our timeline here and see what that sounds like. So that's definitely working. We're getting sound out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to place different drums in different locations. There we go. Same thing. Duplicate it. And what you can do as well is you can press Command 1 and 2 to change the size of this grid. So if we had our open hats in here, now you may notice that it's way too loud. So what you can do is you can click your track to go back to the device editor. You can find the open hat and you can edit it in here. We're going to turn its volume down. You can even change the length of it fade it out. Pitch it up. Now it's become a closed hat. And if we want to change our pattern, we can press command one to shrink our uh, shrink our grid size here.
let's start to put in some toms. Now our tom is ringing out longer than we would like. And the reason for that is if we go over to our tom here, it's in trigger mode, not gate mode. Gate mode means it'll only last as long as the MIDI note. Instead of playing what felt like much longer than the MIDI note would bleed. Now what's cool as well is within MIDI editing, you have what's known as velocity. And if you see these little red lines down here, what velocity is, is it's, you can imagine when you have a drum, you can either hit it lightly or you can hit it hard. That's velocity. So you can actually add velocity to different sounds by clicking a sound, changing its velocity, or even editing several ones at once. You can even hold command while you're editing to do nice little ramps. So you can create nice little sweeps of energy to make things feel a lot more natural. Our claps, for example, are too loud. So we, so we could either go in and edit their ener the volume in the actual drum rack, or we can change their volume here. What's cool as well, when you're working with MIDI like this, is you have a few fun MIDI editing tools as well. You have the ability, you have the ability to stretch your loop to be twice as long. Or twice as fast. You can even do this for individual MIDI notes by highlighting them and changing their speed. Pretty cool. You have the ability to reverse all the notes. which puts them all backwards, or invert them, which actually flips where the note patterns are. So the kick will rise up to the tom, etc. Not good for something like this, but you never know. And then you also have the ability to duplicate loop, which will then just duplicate the whole thing. So you can go in and add variation. Now the problem is our loop is only four bars long on arrangement view, so we can only play four bars of it, even though we can edit it. So we have the option of either changing the start point of it, or alternatively stretching it out to be the full length of time. Now what's nice is if you have this loop function on here, you can actually stretch this out indefinitely. And whenever you see this little dotted part of our clip right here, What's actually happening is it's then looping to the beginning. So check this out. Pay attention to our loop within the clip view as well as the arrangement view. It's gonna loop here. So the arrangement keeps playing, but within that there's an internal loop. So that's just the fundamentals of drum rack and writing drums in MIDI. And I recommend you really play with both writing in audio and MIDI. See what kind of just jives with you and feels more comfortable because there are advantages to each. MIDI you get uh, velocity, you get these cool editing options, you have the ability to at any point uh, switch out a sample by simply clicking and dragging it. You have the editing options within the simpler as itself. So there's a lot to it, which is pretty cool. They both have their advantages. Personally, I write in audio. That's just what I like. Um, but I know a lot of people who write in MIDI. There's nothing wrong with that. So I recommend playing around with it and checking it out. Let's move on to the next part. So in this part, I want to teach you guys about different styles of beats. 
I'm more going to be focusing on tempo and drum placement instead of drum sound because there are very different sounds for each style as well. And I don't want to go into too much depth with that, but I want to more give you guys a very basic foundation of what genres kind of sit around what tempos and where to play specific drums. Really, it's just going to be coming down to the kick and snare and percussion and hi-hats are kind of in the middle of that. And it's really up to you to figure out what you want to do with that. So I'm actually going to leave percussion and cymbals out of this. And I'm simply going to be teaching you guys about kick and snare placement and tempo per genre. So you guys can start writing per beats based off genre style. But it's going to be really up to you to figure out what sounds and how you want to fill that out with cymbals and percussion. And cymbals and percussion do actually play a big part. Obviously, something like drum and bass is going to have really fast cymbals, something like dubstep a little slower and more shuffly. But that's still opening up too big a can of worms. I'm going to keep it to the foundations because this is a crash course. So let's wipe our MIDI clip clean here. And let's start going through some genres. So I'm going to start at a slower tempo. I'm going to start uh, with 80 BPM. And I'm going to talk about our first genre that sits around 80 to 90. Now, again, these aren't hard rules. People will probably argue with me in the comments. I'm just giving you guys a basic guideline. Now, hip hop and hip hop now can really be any tempo. So this is kind of a very big generalization, but old hip hop really sat around 80 to 90, maybe even 100 BPM. And usually how it worked was you would have your snares on the twos here, and I'm going to include a metronome, and then kicks in between with a broken beat pattern. You have a really uh, broken beat and emphasis on broken because the more offset things are, the more kind of groove you get. You can see that just like that, we're starting to get a groove. You can hear how someone would rap over this. And again, this can even go up to 90, even 100. But once you get any faster, you're kind of getting into different genre territory. Again, hip hop so broad that this might not really apply uh, as much anymore, but a lot of old rap and hip hop was usually sitting around that tempo. Next, if we speed things up to 100, 115, this is when we start to get into mid tempo. Now, uh, the reason I use mid tempo into, instead of getting into something specific like glitch hop, or something like that is because there's so many genres that sit around here. And depending on if you have a straight beat versus a broken beat, it's gonna kind of define what it is. So, so something like res would have kind of a slower beat like this. And you would have the kicks landing on the snares, sometimes even slower. Things are very straight. However, if you were to start writing something like glitch hop, well, glitch hop is a lot like hip hop, like we were talking about, but sometimes can get a little quicker and maybe a little more swung out. Next, speeding up, we're getting past the 100, 110, 115 range. We start to get into more house tempos. So 120 to 130, typically 128 is going to be house music. Now, thankfully, this is super easy. Usually you're just going to have kicks on the quarter notes and then snares every other quarter note. And then usually a hi-hat on the upbeat. I know I said I wasn't going to put hi-hats in there, but it's pretty standard, so I feel like I can. And again, usually you can go slower, sometimes 120, even slower into the mid-tempo range, 100, 110, and sometimes as fast as 130, even 135. Now, if you do a broken beat at this tempo, you can get into breaks territory. So 
So next, speeding up, you start to get out of the 130 range and you start to hit 140 to 150. And this is when you get into dubstep. Now dubstep, I could have also technically put at 70, even though it's mostly wrote and written at 140 and 150, it's 140 or 150 on a half time. So these snares happen not every quarter note, but every half bar. And that's how you get the really slow uh, dubstep sound. So dubstep's really sitting around there, goes to around 150. Kicks are always broken, snares always on the on the half bar. And then if you're doing something like rhythm and a lot of modern dubstep, they'll sometimes even just do really straight beats like this. With just hats repeatedly or crashes and hats just happening. Super simple. So that's kind of what you're doing in the 140, 150 range. Then once you're getting out of 140, 150, you start getting into 160, I'd say more so 170, 174 specifically, and maybe as high as 180. That's when you're starting to get into drum and bass. So drum and bass, the snares go back to where they were and kick drums, you have your fundamental one, and then you have the broken offset kick. Now, whenever I put an offset kick, you don't have to copy that identically. That can go anywhere. It's just the ones that are really holding down the fundamental beat. And then I know I said I wasn't gonna do cymbals, but it really gives it the energy uh, you need. Let me just quickly add some cymbals in. Very basic. Obviously, you would wanna do something more interesting, but. starting to get some drum and bass. Now we gotta speed that up. Let's do 174. And then at the end of that, you wrap around or you double the length. We're back into hip hop because half of 174, if we undid that or half of 180 to make our lives easier, is 90 and we're back into hip-hop territory so you really see that all genres all beat styles are just either a broken beat or a straight beat at different tempos and you get different genres but obviously there are no real rules this is just me really generalizing so feel free to argue with me in the comments because even i know i'm wrong about a lot of these but it's just to give you an idea of if you're going for a style that's what you want to do so you can get an idea of what genres you want to write. Let's move on to the next section. So the next section here, we're going to talk about groove because at this point, our beats are robotic. Let's just listen to where we left off in the previous part. A really boring hip hop beat. So if you want to add groove or swing or human feel to a beat, what you want to do is in your clip section, you want to find groove and you want to click these little arrows. This is the hot swap button. What this will do is it'll bring you to Ableton's library of grooves. Now all grooves are, are offset timing and velocity for your MIDI to give it more feel. So instead of it being like super quick, it would give it feel like this. Or if we go into the really basic swing ones, a little bit of swing, more. And if we go to the end, a hell of a lot of swing. So let's see what that sounds like. Let's put this one on to enter. Let's start to add a little more. Let's try another one. Let's go full swing. Now at this point, however, we can't see what's going on because at this point it's doing it to your MIDI live. If you wanna actually commit it so you can see it, but you won't be able to go back and edit it, is you wanna go here, you can hit this commit button. So we can hit commit and boom, there we go. 
we've actually committed it and we can see it there. Now, if we weren't quite satisfied before we committed it, we can even edit each groove. If you open up this little squiggly line section here, this is the groove pool. And what you do is you have extra options. So you could add a bit of randomization to it so it's not always 100%. which is even more human. You can set how much the velocity is actually being affected by the groove. So if we make it 100%, if our swing had any sort of groove options in there, it's gonna affect it even further. You can select the bass, so that's actually what timing is it drawing your notes from and editing them. So if we wanted to, we can make it so it only affected every quarter note worth of MIDI. So the notes in between the quarter notes say stay straight. Well, it's only going to change these ones, but we don't want that. So let's undo that. And then if you want, you can quantize it so that your notes then snap to the grid value, which would defeat the purpose of groove if it was at 100%. But if you wanted, if you thought this was too swingy, you can add just a little bit of quantize to make it a little straighter and cleaner. You can see how that really starts to switch up your groove. And lastly, there's a global amount, which will just turn down the amount that the groove is actually affecting your beat. You can even go over 100%, which will even add more swing. So let's commit that. Look at that. That really messed things up. But also gave us just a brand new beat. So playing with groove is really gonna give things swing, feel, human vibe. I really recommend playing with it. And that's another advantage to MIDI over audio is if you're working in audio where each sound is on a different clip, it's not as easy to integrate groove. You're going to have to do that to the loop specifically. That's a whole other can of worms. But that is how Groove works inside of Ableton. Now the last part here is processing. And I'm going to get into the basics of processing. Let's work with the one in MIDI here. So let's head over to our audio effects and I'm gonna go through and I'm just gonna mention a few that can be really useful for post-processing. So the first is known as a compressor and a compressor is a device that is used to alter the dynamics of a sound. The dynamic range of a sound is how much volume it has from its loudest point its quietest point. So if a sound is very dynamic, it has a big range of volume. If something isn't very dynamic, it doesn't have a big range. And drums being such dynamic sounds because they're big bursts like that, a compressor is really useful because so, it can turn down things that are too loud. For example, on our beat here, I'm finding our snare to be a little too loud. I could turn it down individually but I could also compress the group. Now, I'm gonna give you guys a very quick overview of compressors. We're not gonna go into too much detail. The threshold is a volume setting where the compressor begins to engage. So it won't start squishing the volume of the sound until it goes over this, this threshold. You can see by this little orange gain reduction meter how much it's changing the volume. Now the ratio in basic, most basic terms is how much it's compressing. The higher the ratio, the more it's turning it down, while the lower it is, the less it's turning it down to eventually a one to one ratio, which means it's not even working. Now the attack is how long after it goes above the threshold does it actually take to engage the compressor. So we're actually going to give it a quick attack because we want to really turn down that sound quickly. And then the release is how long after it goes below the threshold does it take for it to stop engaging. So this is working a little too hard. I'm going to bring back our settings here.
And then at the end, you have a dry wet so you can decide how much you want this even engaging. So a compressor is going to be a very useful device. Next up, you have an EQ. And EQing each type of drum separately is going to be very valuable. So for example, on kick drums, the low end of the kick drum, and I'm going to turn our compressor off here, the low end under 100 hertz here is where all the bass is. So if you want your kick drum to be bassier, you can turn that up. Or vice versa, you could turn that down if it's too bassy. The mid-range here is sort of the boxiness of your kick drum. Here how that has that kind of do, do, sort of, do, do, sort of uh, boxiness to it. Up here is where you start to get clarity. And then the top is where you get brightness and crispness. So I personally find this too much uh, on this kick drum. I really liked our kick drum, how it was. And then on something like a hi-hat, which is a lot of white noise, you can choose to make it either more bright or even make it darker if it's too bright and actually start to roll off some of those highs. So EQing each different type of sound is going to be really important. I'm not going to go into detail about how to EQ each type of sound because that's, again, a whole other count of worms. But EQ is going to be a really important tool for you to process your drums. Next, I'm going to recommend reverb. And I'm going to recommend reverb specifically for your snare drum because you hear how uh, dull our snare drum is right now. It doesn't have any depth to it. Well, reverb simulates and emulates rooms. So if you add reverb to your sound, here I can add a bit of echo. So it can be really cool on things like snare drums, but I would be careful because when you use it on something like a kick drum, makes your kick drum sound like it's in a canyon and it really just ruins it. So reverb's a nice one for adding space I recommend playing around with. And then if you wanna give your drum some crunch, you could play with the different distortions in Ableton. So for example, Saturator is a really nice one. I'm actually just gonna put it on the whole drum group. I'm gonna to start to distort this and I'm gonna play around with the settings. Don't worry too much about it. So we really gave it some dirt. So if you really want to give your sound some dirt, some crunch, distortion is good. And then the last tool I recommend, and this is brand new to Ableton 10, is Drum Bus. And Drum, drum Bus is kind of like an all-in-one for everything we talked about except for reverb. But in a, it's got several different uh, parts to it. So the first on the left here is you have some distortion. So it's actually going to add some drive into one of three different distortion types. Then below at the bottom, you have a compressor. Without any settings, you just turn it on and it automatically compresses. You have a dampening tool, which is similar to an EQ, but what it'll do is it'll filter out the highs. So it's not an EQ you can really control, it's just how much are you filtering out the highs. So if your drums are too bright, you can start to filter it down. You have crunch, which is kind of like distortion, but really what it's doing is it's bringing out the mid-range of your sound. So if you find your sounds a little bit too bright, how's a little bit too much sub, you can add some crunch to bring that out. Now you can also play with the transients, and we haven't talked about this word, but the transient is the initial impact of a drum, so how punchy or soft it is. So if we bring it down this way, we actually make the transient more obvious by turning down the bodies of our drums. So you can hear our drums got a lot shorter. 
or the other way will turn up the bodies so the transient might not be as loud in comparison and you really turn up the tails of your sounds. You can play around with that transient there. I kind of liked it nice and short. And then this last section is really fun. This is the boom section. And what it'll do is it'll actually add a low end boom to your sound. So if you don't, if you didn't end up using an 808 or you don't have a bass line in your song, what you can do is you can actually add some boom, pick a frequency. And what's cool is down here, it'll tell you what note it is. So we could go down to an F, click it so it's solidly an F, add more boom. can hear the sub uh, ringing out there and you can change how long it is so if I click this little headphone button this is what we're adding into our sound so let's just turn that down let's make it shorter and then you have a final dry wet so you could go back to our really simple beat or beef it up. So those are some really basic ways you can pro post process your sounds inside of Ableton, but really EQ, compression and distortion, as well as maybe a bit of reverb are gonna be your main tools to alter your drums. So I recommend doing research on those individual things to figure it out. So there we go, guys, that was a lot of information and I know we only kind of dipped our toe in everything, but that's all this was really supposed to be is a quick crash course on how to write beats in Ableton and just to get you guys really thinking about writing beats, how to write beats, the basics of bar structures, the basics of drum racks, the basics of different types of sounds, different types of processing. So I know it's basics, but that's what this is supposed to be. Everyone's got to start somewhere. So what I recommend now is go download my free sample pack in the description of this video and go write some beats. Just go through this, take notes, try and write different styles, different grooves, different sounds, and just see what you can achieve. So let me know what you guys thought of this video. Maybe share it, tell a friend, drop a like, it means a lot. My name's Kermode and I'll be back soon with another video. Peace.